Hello, and welcome to Finley Davies' webinar. I'm a fiduciary, ERISA fiduciary duties and the new regulations. We encourage questions via the chat window, which can be accessed by hovering your cursor over the tab at the top of your screen. From the toolbar, click chat. We'll address all submitted questions at the conclusion of the webinar presentation. All attendees have been muted, so do not click the unmute button at the top of your screen. And please also put your phone on mute. This webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be available on Finley Davies website. You will also receive a link to the recording and a follow-up email. Our presenter today is Jason Rothman, a managing consultant at Finley Davies, leading our firm's technical resources group. He advises clients on plan design, fiduciary compliance, ERISA and DOL plan audits and submissions under the Employee Plan Compliance Resolution System, the Voluntary Fiduciary Correction Program, and the Delinquent Filer Voluntary Compliance Program. In addition, Jason advises employee, employers on their retirement and welfare benefit plan compliance issues. This includes counseling employers on ERISA, the Affordable Care Act, COBRA, HIPAA, and Wellness plan design. And now I'll turn things over to Jason. Thanks, Lisa, and good afternoon to most of you. Uh, good morning to some of you. Um, today we're doing the program on the fiduciary, ERISA fiduciary duties and the new regulations. Um, as some, some of you attended my, my prior webinar in January, back then I talked about the series of programs that we're going to be doing here at Finley Davies. So um, Matt Klein, he, he recently did a, a pension program. And, and about a month ago, I started thinking about what I was going to do for my program. And I decided that I was going to do a fiduciary program. Um, I've, I've done fiduciary training a number of times, spoken on fiduciary issues a number of times. It's, it's an area I, I like working with clients on. And so I started putting together that material. And it was about, oh, 10 days after I decided to do the program, we got the new regulations. And, and, and of course, lots of phone calls, lots of questions. Uh, lots of worried plan sponsors uh, trying to figure out what they needed to do. And, and, and my response to them was first, take a deep breath. Um, you know, think about uh, you know, what your responsibilities are going to be with these new regulations. Um, because frankly speaking, there's, there's, there's a lot of pages to, to read over and, and a lot of compliance issues under these new regulations. But from a plan sponsor's perspective, there, there's, there's some things that we need to worry about. But this isn't really a game changer for us. So, so what we're going to do today is, is we're going to talk about um, general fiduciary concepts under ERISA. Uh, we're going to spend a good chunk of time just just going over the basics. You know, who who is an ERISA fiduciary? What what does a fiduciary responsibility uh, mean for somebody? Uh, what happens if we breach our fiduciary duties? Things like that. So, so the starting point is is we need to know who is a fiduciary. And, and, and for those who are fiduciary, they need to know and understand what their fiduciary duties, responsibilities are. Um, because ultimately, if they don't comply with those, um, there are, sorry, something just popped up on my screen. Um, if we don't comply with our, with our fiduciary duties, there are big risks and there is exposure to uh, penalties, to liability, to possibly sitting in prison. So we're going to talk about these duties and, 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 and why we need to comply with them. And then from there, we're going to talk about investments. We're going to talk investments generally, and then that's going to be the, the starting point of getting into the new final regulations. So, so lots to talk about, lots to cover. Uh, if you've got any questions, you know, feel free to, to put them in the chat or, uh, you know, after this program, uh, you're trying to go to bed and, and you're thinking about a risk of fiduciary. Um, you know, feel free to email or call me the next day and we can talk about ERISA issues, fiduciary issues. So with that, let's get into the program. So first of all, we, the starting point is, you know, what is a fiduciary? You know, just taking a step back, you know, one of the key reasons that ERISA came to be was that we needed some protections for plan participants and, and beneficiaries. And as part of these ERISA rules, we have these fiduciary standards. Um, they're misunderstood. They're not understood. Um, you know, folks know the term fiduciary, but you know, not everybody really knows and understands what that means, what responsibilities it, it puts on them, and even employers themselves. Sometimes they struggle with 
really identifying who's a fiduciary with respect to their plan. So, so let's start with the definition. Well, we look at ERISA Section 321, and that basically says that a person is a fiduciary with respect to the plan to the extent he or she, one, exercises any discretionary authority or discretionary control respecting management of such plans or exercises any authority or control respecting management or disposition of its assets. Two, he or she renders investment advice for a fee or other compensation. And let me pause there because we'll, we'll, we'll get into that investment advice for a fee or other compensation uh, phrase uh, when we talk about the new regulations. Or three, has any discretionary authority or discretionary responsibilities in the administration of plans. So we're talking about management of plan assets, investment advice, or having discretionary authority responsibilities in plan administration. So, so that's where we start. We start with the definition of uh, fiduciary. From there, you know, we gotta decide who is a fiduciary. And, and, and after going through that definition, you see it's really a functional standard. Um, you don't necessarily need consent to become uh, an ERISA fiduciary. Rather, if, if a person has or exercises authority or control or oversees or engages in the activities that I talked about in the prior slide, um, that person may be a fiduciary. So, so who are the key players? Uh, we've got the employer, obviously. We've got the plan sponsor, which in a lot of situations is also the employer. We've got the plan trustee. We may have a committee, and, and I'm gonna talk about committees and their members in a little bit because that's, that's always a concerning area where we have a committee and that committee really isn't doing what it should be doing. Um, but I always, I always get to the issue of delegation. Um, you know, some, some employers delegate responsibilities. It could be delegated internally within the company, it could be delegated to a service provider. Um, usually the employer is not, or the plan sponsor is not doing everything. There, there's delegations of certain responsibilities. With that, you know, there's a few questions that we need to consider. First of all, is there plan language specific specifically allowing for that delegation. And, and taking it a step farther, um, does the plan itself state that delegation and, and who's responsible? You know, for example, are we delegating claims uh, decisions to a committee? Um, are we delegating, you know, broad administration responsibilities to a committee or to a department? Um, I'll talk about ministerial duties and fiduciary duties, but we have delegations with respect to certain administrative uh, things like, you know, eligibility decisions or uh, calculating benefits or things like that. So do we have plan language? The next step, if we don't have plan language specifically addressing the delegation is, do we document that delegation of fiduciary duties? And, and I generally advise folks to make sure that we've documented any delegations of fiduciary duties so that we have it clear on paper and, and when you put pen to paper and, and that document lives, folks know and understand how to deal with fiduciary duties, who's responsible for certain activities. So, so documentation of the delegation. And then, you know, the other consideration, I don't have it on the slide, is uh, if we've got an individual delegating duties, does that individual have the authority to delegate duties? So delegation of, of duties is, is really something that isn't thought about as much as it should, but, but I encourage you to, to consider that in plan administration. Um, I kind of touched on this before. Uh, we have two different areas where we're dealing with the plan. We have fiduciary administration, fiduciary responsibilities um, flowing through the plan, but we also have ministerial. And, and it's important to know and understand the difference between the two because those administrative activities that are ministerial, those are not fiduciary. So, you know, this is, these are basic examples. You know, if we're talking about applying plan rules regarding eligibility, if we're talking about calculating benefits per the plan terms, if we're processing claims, all things that we have specific plan language on that the individual, all they can do is take the facts and take the plan language and apply the two. In those situations, we just have ministerial responsibilities, uh, something that doesn't rise to, to fiduciary standards. Um, it, this is just one of those areas that we need to think about training our employees so they know and understand. And this, this, this reoccurring theme of training employees, you're gonna hear me talk about it a few times, but I really think it's really important. The dual role issue. So this gets into the difference between a settler function and a fiduciary function. 
you know, plan design decisions by an employer, that's on the settler side of things. Administrative decisions by the plan administrator, there we're talking more fiduciary. So, you know, we may have individuals wearing dual hats. You know, sometimes they're making decisions with respect to the plan as, as a settler, and sometimes we're dealing with the plan uh, as a fiduciary. Um, so, so knowing and understanding the difference between what is a settler function and what is a fiduciary function is extremely important. And one of those areas where it's extremely important is when we're dealing with payments of plan-related costs. And, and I'm going to talk about that in a few slides, um, but it's a big issue because you know there, there are employers out there and plans out there that pay certain plan-related expenses out of plan assets. If you don't know which services you're getting in this, whether it's a settler function or a fiduciary function, and you're paying out of plan assets, we could have some fiduciary concerns there. Um, so, like I said, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to that in a little later, but I just wanted to bring it up now. Delegation, um, I talked about it before. Uh, you know, we, we want to make sure that we do it in writing. We want to make sure that we do it in accordance with company and plan structure. So, you know, if the board is, we have a board and, and, and some kind of delegation requires the board to act, uh, we make sure we do that. Um, and then I guess the other thing to keep in mind is that the delegation of fiduciary duty, that in and of itself is a fiduciary act. So one can't say, well, I'm a fiduciary, I'm going to delegate to employee Smith and I'll be fine, I don't have to worry about it. Um, choosing employee Smith is a, is a fiduciary act. So employee Smith must be, you know, if you're delegating certain pension plan responsibilities, uh, Mr. or Mrs. Smith, uh, that individual must, you know, be the right fit for that fiduciary duty. So, so again, you know, that delegation, I, I'm going to talk about it a few times, really important. Um, one thing I, I, I want to raise, and, and, and this goes back to my prior life. In my, in my prior life, I worked as an employee benefits attorney. Um, most recently, I was a shareholder at Ogletree Deacons. And, and, and one area that I'm really sensitive to is, the issue of attorney-client privilege. Um, something not talked about as much as it should, something not considered as much as it should, um, but when we're dealing with the fiduciary, if we're performing fiduciary functions uh, and we reach out to our, our trusted attorney, uh, there's no privilege associated with those communications. Because you have to remember the fiduciary, its responsibilities are to the plan participants. So it's a special rule on the attorney-client privilege. So when we're dealing with a set law function, sure, that, that, that's, that's subject to attorney-client privilege. If we're talking about plan design or, or something like that. But if we're dealing in the fiduciary area, we need to be careful about our communications with, with outside counsel because uh, that, that privilege may not exist when we're dealing with uh, fiduciary matters. So let's talk about what are the fundamental fiduciary duties that we have. Um, there's the list right there. Um, you know, we, we have really four key fiduciary duties. We've got the exclusive benefit, we have the prudent person, we have the diversification, we have the follow plan documents. Those are the four keys. And then I also throw in the fifth one, which is it's not, you know, we wouldn't list it as a fundamental fiduciary duty, but uh, we always have to keep in mind that we have a responsibility as a fiduciary to avoid uh, prohibited transactions. So with that, let's get into some of the details about these specific fiduciary duties. So first of all, exclusive benefit. What does the exclusive benefit rule say? Well, it says that fiduciaries have to act for the exclusive purpose of providing benefits to participants and their beneficiaries and defraying reasonable expenses of administering the plan. Um, so, so this is where I want to talk about the issue of paying out uh, uh, plan assets, paying expenses. So. Um, there, there's, there's, again, we have the settler function and we have the fiduciary um, uh, function. If we're doing settler functions, we cannot pay those expenses out of plan assets. So if we're doing something like strategic planning um, for plan formation or plan design, something strategic with respect to our employee benefit plan, that's being done at the settler level and that cannot be paid out of plan assets. If it were to be done, that would be a fiduciary breach and the Department of Labor would not be very happy with you. Now, if we're talking about administrative fiduciary type um, 
functions, you know, if, if we got expenses associated with preparation of a summary plan description, distribution of the SPD, non-discrimination testing, benefit calculations, you know, those types of things, those are generally fiduciary in nature and they can be paid out of plan assets. So be careful about using plan assets to pay expenses. This is one of those areas that when the Department of Labor comes in to audit a plan, they're going to ask for documentation of any expenses paid out of plan assets and, and analyze whether those were properly done. So um, very, very important thing to keep your eye on to make sure that um, you're complying with, with ERISA. Next we have the prudent person standard. And basically that requires fiduciaries to exercise the care, skill, prudence, and diligence under the circumstances that a prudent person acting in a like capacity and familiar with such matters would use in the conduct of an enterprise of like character and with like aims. That is your ERISA um, prudent person standard. The key in all this is the decision-making process. That's, that's, that's the most important thing that we are focused on for the prudent person standard because generally speaking, prudent actions, even if down the road they prove to be mistaken, they may be enough to avoid liability. So, you know, having that prudent analysis of an issue and then taking some kind of action that is prudent given the factors, if, you know, things turn around and we discover after the fact that, you know, that was probably not the best direction, but it was a good decision at the time or a reasonable um, position at the time, um, you're generally going to be okay. Um, you know, this is, this is a big issue when we're talking about the selection and monitoring of plan investments, um, a big issue when we're talking about our investment policy statements. Uh, that's something that I'm going to get into a little more detail uh, later on during this program. So diversification. Um, we have a certain diversification standard basically saying that we must diversify plan investments so as to minimize the risk of large losses unless under the circumstances it's not prudent to do so. That, that, that's our standard. Um, it, it's really a big ticket item for uh, 401k plans, um, making sure we have a proper investment lineup. Um, you know, we, we need to have a lineup that takes into account different uh, risks and different return characteristics so we can't have, you know, five large cap funds and say, okay, those are your five investments, uh, you pick those. No, you have to have large cap, small cap, mid-market, et cetera. So making sure you have a, a, a broad investment lineup. Then you've got the uh, issue of employer stock, and I'm going to talk about employer stock uh, in a couple different areas. Here we're talking about diversification. Um, if, say, for example, you have a 401k plan where the match is done in the form of employer stock, you have to give folks the ability uh, to, to, to diversify, and there's very specific rules on diversification with respect to employer stock in that situation. Okay, this is this is one of those where, you know, you, you pretty common sense, uh, fiduciaries must follow the terms of the plan document. But he, it's important to note that the responsibility to follow the terms of the plan document is required so long as they're consistent with ERISA. Um, now, yes, the failure to follow can be an ERISA violation, but, you know, what does that mean so long as they are consistent with ERISA? Well, let me give you an example. Let, let's talk about stock drop cases. Um, and I'll talk about stock drop, stock drop a couple of times. But in, in, in this situation, we're, we're talking about following plan documents. So, you know, for, for those of you who work with retirement plans you, over the course of, you know, it's been more than a few years now, we've seen lots of uh, varying litigation with respect to stock drop and, and, and stocks that are held in a retirement plan. You know, stocks are doing great, and then they tumble, and then plan participants bring a class action because uh, the investment's arguably shouldn't have been provided under the plan. Well, you know, say, you know, again, we have the typical situation where you've got a company match in the form of stock. Um, what I've seen is some employers have had that match in company stock hardwired in the terms of the plan document. So what, are the, what have the fiduciaries said? Well, the fiduciaries have said, well, I had to follow the terms of the plan document, so we couldn't take that investment out of the plan. So that's my defense. My defense is I had to follow the terms of the plan document. Well, the great majority of the courts have said, no, nah, that, that, that defense doesn't work because, yeah, you have, to respond, you have the responsibility to follow the terms of the plan document, but it has to be consistent with ERISA, and you've had other fiduciary duties 
to analyze that plan investment and consider having it taken out and, and doing something about getting it take out, taken out. So just relying on the plan document defense doesn't work. Uh, plan document considerations, I, I say Firestone language, what is that? That's that language that we put in all benefit plans that basically says that uh, the, the, the plan administrator has the discretion to interpret the terms of the plan. Why is that important? Well, it's important because the courts, uh, when they review that decision, that fiduciary interpretation, it's going to be reviewed at a very high standard. We're talking arbitrary capricious as opposed to de novo. Um, very, very important for uh, fiduciaries to have that discretionary language in their plans. It allows them to interpret things, and generally speaking, unless their decisions are you know crazy, uh, they'll they'll be held up. Uh, claims procedure. You want to make sure we have a sound claims procedure in the plan document. You know, you also have that in you know summary plan descriptions and, and other documents. But having that clear claims procedure is, is extremely important. You know, I, I talk about the claims procedure as a weapon in litigation because if the plan participant doesn't follow the claims procedure properly, the court's going to throw the case out. Um, now that being said, a sound claim decision can be undermined if the employer, the plan administrator, fails to process it under the terms of the plan. So have that claims procedure, but make sure that you follow it. All right, prohibited transactions. So what, 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 are, what are the prohibited transactions um, prohibit us to do? Well, ERISA prohibits fiduciaries from self-dealing with plan assets and acting in any capacity on either side of the transaction if the fiduciary interests conflict with plan participant interests. Um, self-dealing, that, that, that's obviously a, a, a big issue. Um, the other uh, type of prohibited transaction is any kind of transaction between a plan and a party in interest. So, you know, just, just as a reminder, a party in interest would include any fiduciary, uh, any service provider, the employer, the union, employees, officers, directors, uh, owners, uh, groups like that. Um, there are exemptions. There's a whole lot of exemptions, prohibited transaction exemptions. Um, you know, one of the most important ones is allowing plans to work with service providers. So, you know, a plan can pay Finley Davies for services, or they can pay their attorney for services, things like that. You know, again, the focus here is, is what is going on between the plan and any fiduciary. So, you know, we wouldn't allow a plan to make a $500,000 loan to the owner of the company. Um, you know, that's just a per se prohibited transaction. Why do we care about it? Well, the biggest thing here are excise taxes. If you have a prohibited transaction, we need to worry about excise taxes. But there's other things that can come into play, and, and that's where we get into the kind of, uh, you know, so what? So why do I care about fiduciary liability? Um, well, we care about fiduciary liability for a number of reasons, and, and this is the list why we care. Uh, personal liability, yes. Uh, if we have a fiduciary breach, that fiduciary is personally liable to make the plan whole. Um, you have to restore the plan, profits and losses associated with that breach. Uh, I skipped over that second one. Uh, I want to spend a little time on co-fiduciary liability because I think this is really, really important. So keep in mind that fiduciary liability is, is joint and several. So if we've got uh, multiple parties, we, we've got joint and several liabilities. Um, in this, in this co-fiduciary liability concept, fiduciaries have to know and understand that they could be held liable for a breach of another if, and I'll go through this list because it's important, if one, the individual knowingly participates or undertakes to conceal a breach, so that's one, so they, they actively do something with respect to the breach. Two, through neglect of their duties, they enable someone else to commit a breach. So they have not fulfilled their fiduciary duties, you know, say it's a committee member on some fiduciary committee and that person just doesn't come to any of the committee meetings and, uh, you know, finds out down the road that one of the fiduciaries in the committee uh, took a bunch of money and if, if the person would have gone to the meetings, couldn't have happened. That neglect of duties can result in co-fiduciary liability. And then the third one is if the individual has knowledge of a breach, and doesn't make reasonable efforts to remedy the breach, that person can also be uh, liable as a co-fiduciary. So, you know, the first one makes, you know, is, is pretty obvious if they knowingly participate in the breach or conceal a breach, fine. But the next two, you know, not fulfilling their fiduciary duties and 
uh, enabling someone to commit a breach or having knowledge of breach and not doing anything about it, you know, we, we can expose ourselves to, to fiduciary liability. So, yeah, this, this is just one of those other areas why we need to train folks about their fiduciary duties and what it means. Uh, skipping down, uh, just noting that plan assets can't be used to pay the liability. It's got to come out of the individual's pocket or the employer's pocket. Uh, civil penalties, yes, there are civil penalties associated, associated with fiduciary breaches. And then finally, yeah, prison. Um, it's possible. Uh, if, if, if we have a willful ERISA violation, we can be talking about a maximum of $100,000 or 10 years in prison. And beyond that, you know, in, in a lot of situations when we're talking about fiduciary breaches, we're dealing with something that is criminal in activity. We're talking about embezzlement. We're talking about theft, conversion, bribery, things like that. So there's a lot of... <laughs> a lot of negatives associated with, with fiduciary breaches because, you know, the, the Department of Labor um, has really recognized through some, some bad events that have occurred in the past that, uh, you know, if we don't really put the hammer down and, and, and have folks fulfill their fiduciary duties, it can have significant impacts on the plan participants. And like I said before, the whole purpose of ERISA, one of the big purposes of ERISA was to protect plan participants. So. Yeah, telling folks that they can go to prison or write big checks is, is, is definitely a, a way to protect those plan participants. Uh, one thing I didn't note on this slide is that in the event we have a fiduciary breach, there is a program to correct certain breaches. Um, I, I talked about this program when I did my seminar in January, this, uh, the, the program, the Voluntary Fiduciary Correction Program. This is a program that the Department of Labor put out there to allow folks to fix fiduciary breaches. Now, it can't be used for everything. Uh, there's a list of about, um, I believe, what, 19 different breaches that can be corrected under the program. Um, basically, the goal of, of, of an employer using the program is that you get a no-action letter from the Department of Labor saying that they won't take action with respect to the plan. Um, it's a good program. Um, I use it for clients all the time. Most common examples of that using the program is, one, the, the, the plan asset issue I raised before, using plan assets to pay for things that really shouldn't have been paid out of plan assets. Uh, the other is uh, the issue of, of employee deferrals not being transferred over to the trust within a reasonable time. Um, we could spend a whole, lot, a whole lot of time talking about that issue, but just as a reminder, uh, the uh, Department of Labor doesn't look very favorably on employers who take you know, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, a month, you know, quarterly, uh, getting the employee deferrals into a 401k plan from general assets to the uh, to the plan's trust. Uh, rule of thumb is a couple of days. Um, I've I've fought with the Department of Labor for a number of clients on this issue. Some some have said one day, some have said two days. I fought about it being the day of payroll. Um, so that's just just one of those examples of situations where you can use the voluntary correction program and fix a, a fiduciary compliance issue. All right, so let's move on to plan investments. And then before we get into the final regulations, uh, let's just talk about this just generally. Um, you know, the first fiduciary consideration we have when we're talking about plan, plan investments, one that comes to mind most often, I think, is ERISA 404C. And, and that's where we have our 401k plan and uh, you know, we're allowing folks to make their investment election. Um, ERISA 404C, generally uh, requires the plan permitting participants um, to have a broad range of investments. Uh, you gotta have at least three with uh, diversified categories of, of investments uh, with different risk return characteristics. Um, also, uh, you have to allow folks to give investment elections uh, at least quarterly, I mean, that's the standard. Um, Maybe more often, depending on the plan's investment options. Again, that's under the standard. In the real world, most folks have the ability to make elections on you know, a daily basis. They have access to the internet and they can uh, make investment elections online. So that's kind of the old standard. Doesn't really uh, you know, come into play as much anymore today. You gotta let folks ex exercise control of investments on an independent basis. And then you have to make sure that folks get the information, current information about the plan and investments. Um, it's only partial relief. I, employers and plan sponsors need to remember that they still have the need to monitor those plan investments. And, and that's, that gets me to the investment policy statement. Um, 
investment policy statements are, are important. They're important to have, much more important to follow when you have them. Uh, unfortunately, all too often, I'll see just employers with beautiful investment policy statements. Uh, they were written 12 years ago, and they've sat in a drawer ever since then, and they haven't been followed. Uh, it, that creates issues. You know, these investment policy statements, we'll, we'll discuss, you know, maybe who's on the committee, how they're going to pick their funds, they're going to list the funds, um, they're how they're going to monitor them. You know, if things are performing poorly, they'll put them on a watch list after being on a watch list for so long, then they'll replace them after doing, you know, some kind of, you know, due diligence on, on proper replacements. Like I said, in the real world, unfortunately, some employers just either A, don't have an investment policy statement, or B, has an investment policy statement and they don't follow them. Um, it's, it's important to have a well-written IPS and very important to follow it because, again, if you have that 12-year-old investment policy statement that you haven't been following and 12 years later you get sued about the investments, um, you know, what, what it's going to come down to is whether you follow that investment policy statement and made reasonable decisions based on that investment policy statement. If you haven't done it, you're exposing yourself to, to fiduciary liability. So investment policy statements, uh, this is this is my my reminder to check those and, and, and make sure you're following them. Uh, fee disclosures, you know, there's very specific fee disclosure rules when it comes to individuals. We got to make sure that we're distributing them to folks. I, I talked a little bit about the employer stock and stock drop litigation. Um, you know, that's still an area out there. There are I know of plan sponsors who have company stock within their 401k plan um, and who are strongly considering taking that stock out. Um, there's been some recent ESOP litigation that has, you know, made folks think about it. Um, you know, this isn't to say that employer stock is not a prudent investment. Um, there are reasons to have it in your plan, um, but, you know, you just want to make sure that you're analyzing it, um, you know, treating it just like any other investment fund, analyzing whether it should be part of the investment lineup. And that gets us to the final fiduciary rules. So we're going to shift gears a little bit, and instead of talking about general fiduciary issues, we're going to talk about the, the, the final fiduciary rules. And, and, and like I said before, these regulations came out and made people very nervous. Um, yeah, my response to all of it is, okay, plan sponsors, take a breath. Uh, we, first of all, we've got time. Second of all, there's not a, a huge amount of things that you all will need to do. Um, if I've got any uh, financial institutions on the line, any brokers, uh, a little different for you, uh, a lot of considerations for you, um, so, so, so let's talk about it. So, you know, the issue here is that we have 40, 40 plus year old guidance on, on how to deal with um, investment advice and, and the fiduciary standards associated with that. So we have these outdated rules. It really were, were meant for the defined pension plan world, defined benefit pension plan world. You know, back then we weren't really dealing with 401k plans and, and, and IRAs. Today, you know, we have heavy marketing to individuals, whether it be a plan participants or IRA owners, and those individuals, they just don't have that investment expertise. So, so what do they do? Well, they go out to somebody who holds himself out as an investment expert. But, you know, they, they really don't have the ability to know if they're getting quality advice. So what is the standard that those investment advisors have when they are advising, you know, somebody who's making retail investments or making investments associated with their IRA? Under the new rules, we, we, we need to basically take into account the best interests of that individual. And, and that wasn't what it was before. You know, it, what it was before was a much softer, looser standard and you know frankly speaking there were some uh some bad guys out there that were making investment elections and they were making uh good commissions or fees or or whatever the the the, the revenue stream is off of those investment elections so so yeah you know there's a conflict of interest um you know you, the individual would think well they're going to make the the investment uh they're going to give me investment advice in my best interest but unfortunately uh, that that wasn't always the case. And when the Department of Labor issued the guidance, it was interesting because the Department of Labor did, it was about a one, one hour, one hour and 20 minute uh, webcast announcing the regulations. And, and they really focused on that issue. They focused on the, 
you know, the middle class individual who wanted to get advice about, you know, where to roll over their funds and how to invest their, their you know, IRA and, and, and things like that and making sure that those folks were taken care of. So, so that's, that's the whole reasoning behind the regulations. Now, we initially had proposed rules in 2010. Um, they were withdrawn the following year because of the outcry from the uh, investment community. Uh, 2015, it was reissued, a uh, little bit softer. Um, of course, there was over 3,000 comment letters in response to the proposed rules. And then finally, we got the final rules, um, you know, just a few weeks ago, April 8th, and, and that's why we're here talking about it today. Um, I mean, for, for me, you know, the concern is, is, is why do we care? Well, there's a direct impact on financial advisors that a plan may work with. So. You know, the big big issue for me is, is, is going to be, when it, and, and this, this, this advice and, and this discussion is focused on the employer plan community. I'm, I'm focusing on plan sponsors here. So we care because we have contracts with our, with our vendors, with our investment advisors. Um, so, so I'll talk about your to-do to list later, but that, that's the biggest issue for me is, 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 is how these rules impact our agreements with our vendors. So with that in mind, let's start with the old rule. And then we can talk about the new rule. So the old rule, and, and I apologize for these next few slides. I, I, I don't like having a lot of information on the slides when I speak, but I, I thought it was important to give you everything under the rules. So, so I give you the old rule in you know, all its glory and all its detail, and I do the same for the new rule. And I also get into uh, some of these new terms of arts that we need to know and understand. So, so these next, uh, you know, maybe eight, to 10 slides, they, they have a lot of information. So uh, if you're looking at your computer, you can probably read it. If you're printing it off six to a slide, uh, you may want to rethink that. But I thought it was important to give you all the information. So so the old rule, five-part test. It's a very narrow definition. And, and I'll talk about how broad the new definition is. But the old rule was, was, was a very narrow, um, you know, five-part test. Uh, was the advice? rendered as to the value of securities or other property, or are we recommending the advisability of investing in purchasing, selling securities or other property? Is it provided on a regular basis? Is it pursuant to a mutual agreement with the plan or plan fiduciary? Um, was the advice the primary basis for the investment decision? Uh, was that advice individualized based on the needs of the plan? Very narrow definition. And, and, and really a definition that didn't really that doesn't really fit in the 21st century. So with that, we have the new rule. And, and the new rule is, is much more broad. Uh, it's broad when it, we're talking about plans because it takes into account, yes, ERISA plans, keeping in mind ERISA plans has themselves all the fiduciary requirements, but it also brings in other things, uh, biggest being IRAs. So, so folks dealing with IRAs um, need to know and understand these rules, if they're providing investment advice to an individual with respect to their IRA or to a, you know, a rollover to an IRA, those folks need to know and understand these new rules because it's going to apply to them. Also, interestingly, it applies to HSAs. Um, you know, we know HSAs have investment components to them. So, so we're talking about ERISA plans, we're talking about IRAs, we're talking about HSAs. Um, I'm not going to just read all of this because there's a lot to read, um, but there, there, there's some, some key themes here. Um, first of all, if you look at number one, number one, we're talking about um, any kind of advice for a fee or other compensation, direct or indirect. We're going to talk in a couple slides what that term means because that's important. The new rule takes into account that the investment advice is being given and provided for a fee or other compensation, whether it's direct or indirect. We'll talk about what all those types of things are. And then the second point is, and, and I'm not going to read it all, is that in A, and then on the next slide, B, we're talking about recommendations. And you might think, eh, recommendation, you know, we know what that means. Well, recommendation is defined very specifically. So we need to know that, you know, the first thing we have to think about is, okay, well, is, is the service being given is the advice being given for a fee or other compensation, and are we dealing with what the rule defines as a recommendation? So, so we're going to talk about that in a minute. So, you know, ultimately, you know, A, we're talking about, you know, acquiring 
um, or holding, disposing, exchanging of the investment options. And in B, we're just talking about um, you know the management of, of of the property, the recommendations associated with the property. You know how we're going to um, select the investment accounts, uh, things like that. So it's not going to waste your time and read it. Now we get. Um, you know, we get these specific rules about the investment advice recommendation. Um, the, the, the individual making the, the advice either A, has to acknowledge, represent that it's acting as a fiduciary, or it's rendering the advice pursuant to a written agreement that the advice is based on the individual needs, or directs the advice um, to a specific advice recipient or the recipient regarding the advisability of a particular investment or management decision with respect to securities or other investment property of the plan or IRA. So I read that real quickly, but we need to know and understand that, you know, if we go back the past couple slides, we have, you know, either a recommendation under these uh, A and B under one, and then two, we have this person either recognizing a risk of status or specifically uh, noting the investment advice given pursuant to an agreement or, um, you know, the, it's, it's directed advice. So um, this is what we're dealing with. We're dealing with investment advice for a fee or other compensation as it relates to a specific individual and their investments. So this is, this is where we get into the, the issue of what is and what is not a recommendation because recommendation is very specific. Um, so, so I say here, recommendation is a communication that would reasonably be viewed on an objective basis as a suggestion that the advice recipient engage in or refrain from taking a particular course of action. Now, again, remember, we're talking about investments. So um, we're, we're talking about the investment, you know, advice, comments, you know, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an objective standard as to that communication. Um, you know, we take into a, a Take into account the, the content, the context, how it's presented, how the communication is laid out to that individual. And, and the general theme here, again, it's an objective test, but the more closely tailored the communication is to an individual, the more likely that it is going to be a recommendation. Um, now, you know, it can get even fuzzier because if we have, you know, one action analyzed by itself, that doesn't get to this recommendation level, um, we may have a series of actions that taken together, they may be deemed a recommendation. So the investment advisors are gonna have to be careful about you know, giving one piece of, of, of advice and then another and then another and then another because while those, each of those pieces by themselves may not be a recommendation, it is possible that taken together, they could be deemed a recommendation. And then the other point here is that a recommendation can be made by a human or it can come via technology through a computer. Uh, there's all kinds of good computer programs out there and somebody could go on the internet and, and use somebody's technology and get a recommendation. So um, the investment advisor community is gonna have to take into account their technology and their programs online uh, so that uh, if they are given recommendations, that they comply with the new regulations. All right, so what if not a recommendation? So, so the DOL in its rules specifically called out uh, certain things as not being recommendations. So the first one is uh, making available a platform of investment alternatives. So, um, you know, if we've got, you know, planned fiduciaries independent of the person marketing, or making available of the platform and the person discloses in writing to the plan fiduciary that the person is not undertaking to provide um, the, the investment advice or give advice as a fiduciary, just offering up a platform of, of investment alternatives, that is not gonna be a recommendation. Now, the second one is investment selection and monitoring assistance. So if the person identifying investment discloses in writing whether the person, well, it requires the person identifying investment decisions um, they, they disclose in writing whether that person has a financial interest in the investments and the nature of the interest. Um, so, so we can have somebody make investment selection and monitoring assistance, but they're basically going to have to disclose any interest 
that they may have. Uh, general communications that a reasonable person would not view as investment recommendations are specifically excluded from the term recommendation. So what does that include? That'll include things like general newsletters, talking about the market, research reports, general market data, performance reports, uh, like prospectuses, um, things like that. There, there's other things uh, in the regs, there's a whole laundry list, but those are the, the ones that jump out to me. And then the final one is investment education. Now, that requires that the educational material not include certain specific investment recommendations. So, so what does that include? Well, there's, there's plan information and talking about the benefits of plan participation. So, for example, if, if you go out to folks and say, yeah, you know, we have this 401k plan, and oh, yeah, if you participate, you'll get a match in company stock, uh, you, you know, it's, it's, it's good for you. It'll help you with your retirement. You know, that is just going to be deemed investment education, not a recommendation. Uh, giving general financial investment and retirement information, uh, that's general investment education. So if you're given information about assessing risk tech, or risk tolerance or, you know, giving information about estimating future retirement needs or determining an investment time horizon for an individual, that's just purely an investment education. Um, also included is asset allocation models and interactive investment materials. So, so as long as it's not targeted, um, it's, it's generally going to be okay. So let's talk about this term fee or other compensation, direct or indirect. Um, so, I mean, there it is. Uh, I'm not going to read it, but, you know, it's, it's really that broad concept of any kind of revenue streams that could come in associated with the advice. Uh, yeah, I give the, the, the common examples. If we've got commissions, if we've got revenue sharing, if we have loads, finder fees, uh, gifts, gratuities, any kind of income or property coming in associated with a recommendation of, of, of investment, um, it's going to fall under this fee or other compensation, direct or indirect. We also have this other term, in connection with or a result of. Um, if the fee for compensation would not have been paid but for the transaction or service or if eligibility for the amount of fee or compensation is based in whole or in part on the transaction or service. It's a but for test. But for the advice, um, the, the, the fee or commission would not have been made. So, so that's what we need to know and understand when we're talking about um, the receipt of those, those fees. They have to be in connection with or as a result of the advice. So do we have some safe harbors? Yes, we have some safe harbors. I'm not going to get into a whole lot of detail today on this um, other than number three. Uh, the, the first two, there's a seller's exemption. We're basically dealing with sophisticated investors with at least uh, $50 million in assets. Um, there's, there's a second one for swap and security-based swap transactions. Third one is, is the key one that I see for employers to think about, and, and that's the safe harbor for employees. Uh, there's a specific exemption for employees serving in their employee capacity for essentially their employer or really for a union or, or a fiduciary. As long as the individual, you know, the individual could give some kind of advice, some kind of communications associated with investments, but if they're not receiving any fees or compensation associated with the advice, which is, you know, generally going to be the case, then they're going to be exempt from uh, fiduciary status under this specific investment advice rule. I wanted to just touch upon this one uh, prohibited transaction exemption. Um, the starting point here, again, is that individuals who provide fiduciary investment services are not permitted to receive payments that create conflicts of interest without being covered by a prohibited transaction. That's the general rule. If we've got, you know, a, a fiduciary or if we have a party in interest, uh, we, we can't have assets flowing between the two unless we have a prohibited transaction exemption. Um, the, the regulations, when they came out, uh, we had 200-plus 200, 200 pages of regulations associated with these new regulations. Um, but we also got some amendments to some prohibited transaction, prohibited transaction exemptions and also um, some new ones. And, and this is the new one. It's the best interest contract exemption. Uh, we, we also call it the BICE exemption, and it allows fiduciaries to receive variable rate compensation, again, commissions, 12B1 fees, revenue sharing, things like that, uh, if certain requirements are met. And, and we're talking about advice to retail 
investors. So, so most commonly we're talking about, you know, folks who have rolled over their money to an IRA and, and then are getting investment advice. All right, so what are the requirements? Uh, a number of requirements. Um, note that we're just talking about financial institutions. Uh, that's the focus. So, so we're talking about banks, RIAs, insurance companies, and broker-dealers. Uh, it, it requires them to acknowledge their fiduciary status. Um, they, they need to put together um, um, some policies and procedures uh, to make sure that they act impartially, um, you know, making sure that they specifically state that they're going to be providing advice that's in the customer's best interest. Well, again, we have that best interest standard, and that's why we have it called the best interest contract exemption. Um, you know, the other reason it's called the best interest contract exemption is because we have to have an enforceable contract. Um, again, the focus here is advice to IRAs and non-ERISA plans. Um, they don't have ERISA protections, but uh, it requires these folks to have enforceable contracts, laying out all these things, laying out the responsibilities, laying out their duties. Um, you know, it requires them to make certain disclosures, um, some pre-transaction disclosures, some, some transactional-based disclosures, some web-based disclosures. They have a responsibility to communicate with the Department of Labor. They have to notify the Department of Labor that they're relying on this. And, and then finally, there's a record-keeping requirement. Basically, it requires them to uh, keep things for six years. All right, so effective date. When, when do we have to start worrying about this? Well, the final rule was published uh, April 8th. Um, it's effective, basically. Uh, June 7th, 2016, but we're really talking about the applicability date, um, and that's April 10, 2017. So that's really what we're focused on is that April 10th, 2017 date. Now that advice exemption, um, that effective date is January 1, 2018. So, so what does that all mean? What, from, from a general fiduciary perspective, from the uh, new regulation perspective, you know, what, what are we as plan sponsors as plan administrators, what do we need to be thinking about? Well, the first thing that I always recommend, and, and now that we have these regulations, just another reason to think about it is doing a fiduciary audit. Let's analyze our plan documents. Let's analyze our committees. Let's look at our vendors. Let's look at our contracts. Let's check our delegations. And let's audit everything and, and make sure that, you know, folks, we make sure we know who the fiduciaries are, make sure that we've delegated who has what fiduciary responsibilities, and, and, and make sure that everybody is doing things correctly and in accordance with the plan documents and, and, and then what we want to be doing. We want to understand when our service providers are wearing their fiduciary hats when giving advice. Uh, you know, we want to make sure that they're held to that higher standard. Uh, we also need to think about that privilege issue like I talked about before. Um, review all service provider agreements. Um, like I said, this is this is a big item for me. The reality is that you'll probably hear from these investment advisors um, with respect to their agreements because they're probably going to be making some, some tweaks. Uh, I recommend that you review all investment education material provided by the vendors because um, our concerns really under the final regulations on our end is, is making sure that the proper communications have been made with respect to, you know, what happens if, if somebody's terminated and, and you know, are, are the vendors marketing their their IRAs? Are they marketing investments in their investments in the IRAs? Things like that. So we need to review that investment material, and then also review plan participant material related to investments, rollovers, distributions. To continue my list. Uh, we need to analyze the fiduciary structure for the benefit plans, and in that again, this is this is another reoccurring theme I have is address committees and consider documentation of the delegations. Um, you know, I, I've, I've worked with employers in dealing with committees. Um, you know, when I audit and, and advise on those committees, you know, the, you kind of ask, okay, well, who, who's on the committee? Um, you know, are, are they just benefit folks? Do we have folks, you know, do we have people in finance? Uh, do we have people who are, you know, experts in that area? Do we have, you know, the well, do we have a welfare committee? Do we have a pension committee? I, I kind of like dividing functions, dividing committees, um, having separate investment committee uh, apart from, you know, your, maybe your pension and maybe your welfare committees. Um, you know, how do we deal with executive compensation? Uh, do we have that be the, the board compensation committee responsible for that on the fiduciary function or what? And then, you know, also note that whenever you have these committees together, um, make sure we have minutes put together. 
I, I can remember a, a Fortune 500 company I worked with a few years ago, who they had they had a pension committee, uh, they had a giant pension plan. DOL came and audited the operations of the pension plan, and there were no minutes of uh, the pension committee meeting. And in fact, there was only two people who were still actively employed who were listed on the pension committee. So. You know, I, I recommend just making sure that things are accurate, current, and well thought out when it comes to having uh, fiduciary committees associated with our plans. And then training. Training keeps on popping up. I think training is very important. Make sure that we train employees on ERISA fiduciary requirements, whether or not they're actually fiduciaries, because we want to make sure that folks know what their responsibilities are, uh, what it means to be a fiduciary, whether or not they've been delegated fiduciary duties, um, so that when they are performing their services, they do what they're supposed to do, and also don't do what they're not supposed to do. And then, I'm going to repeat myself here, and it's intentional, analyze all vendor contracts that may be impacted by the new DOL rules. Um, you may hear from your vendors, but, but I'd be proactive. Uh, you got plenty of time because we basically have a year for compliance. But, but go back into our agreements, go back into our documents, and, and look and see what we need to do with respect to those documents. So I know we're pushing up against an hour, but, but I like bringing this all back into the real world, um, given some just real basic uh, hypothetical situations where, where folks may be a fiduciary, may not be a fiduciary, may be you know, doing their fiduciary responsibilities incorrectly, things like that. So, so I've got a, a six-question test for you that we'll go through very quickly. Um, you'll also probably see um, who my allegiance are when it comes to sports. Uh, so first, we've got Bernie. He's the HR manager at Brown's company, and he's got pension plan responsibilities. And as part of those responsibilities, and these are his only responsibilities, he calculates benefits according to the terms of the plan. He prepares governmental reports, so he prepares that Form 5500 for the pension plan, and he conducts plan orientation and plan enrollment. Is Bernie a fiduciary? Well, if, if that's all it is, he's just doing these three things, well, the answer is probably no. Um, those are basic ministerial functions. Um, we're going to assume here that he's operating within the framework of the plan. He's, he's you know, deciding benefits. He's deciding eligibility um, in accordance just within the terms of the plan. Um, he just doesn't have discretion or authority. He, he, he has job duties, and those job duties are to follow the terms of the plan, um, and, and that's it. So, so Bernie in this situation, no, not a fiduciary. Two. So is this the fiduciary act? So Urban gets a call from plan participant Archie, and Archie is confused and asks for an interpretation of the plan terms. Urban reviews the plan, agrees the SPD is confusing, and interprets the plan in Archie's favor, providing for the benefits he asked for. Is that a fiduciary act? Well, the answer is yes. Um, he's exercising discretionary authority. Um, he's doing that by interpreting the terms of the plan. Now, is this high risk? Well, probably not because he's given what Archie wants. Archie uh, you know, came in with his view and asked for an interpretation, and, and the payout's going to be based on, on, on Archie's uh, positive view of it. Now, if it went the other way, we could have an issue. Um, we could have an issue that, um, you know, that, that, that fiduciary act uh, was, was, was wrong. Um, and then we also have the question of whether or not uh, uh, Urban even had those fiduciary uh, duties delegated to him, which could create other employment-related issues. Um, so again, the, the focus here is we have an interpretation. We, we've done something with discretion, and that's going to rise to um, fiduciary status. So question three. So Monster's 401k plan offers a number of investment options. The majority of the investment funds are retail share class. Is this a fiduciary breach? Well, what should have triggered in your brain is the reference to retail funds. Uh, the answer here is probably yes. Um, if, if Monsters, Inc. and the planned fiduciary did not investigate the availability of institutional funds, which, as we know, generally have lower fees, uh, that would be a fiduciary breach. I, I see, see Tibble Edison. That, that's kind of the, the key case that, that dug into this issue. Um, so, so this is just a reminder uh, to make sure that we have the proper class of funds in our fund lineup for our retirement plans. So let's, three more, we'll go through them quickly because I want to make sure uh, we stick in an hour. Uh, 
Uh, question four, delinquent employee deferrals. So LeBron returned to Cavs Co. as benefits manager, surprisingly, and discovered that employee deferrals were being transferred to the 401k plan trust on a quarterly basis. Is this a problem? Do we have a correction program? Uh, yeah, we, we definitely have an issue here. Uh, this is a breach of fiduciary duties. It's a prohibited transaction. Um, I didn't talk about it in a whole lot of detail, but, but I mentioned it before. We have very specific requirements on dealing with employee deferrals and timely getting them into the plan trust. There's a little bit of confusion on this rule because the regulation basically says, oh, you have until the 15th day of the following month, but what people forget to read is um, the fact that the standard is really as reasonable as, 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 as soon as reasonably practical. So, like I said before, the DOL says in a lot of cases, two days, three days, if you're a small plan with under 100 participants, there's a seven-day safe harbor. Here we're talking about quarterly. Um, it's definitely a fiduciary breach. I talked about the Voluntary Fiduciary Correction Program. This is something that fits in it perfectly. Uh, what you have to do is reimburse for the lost earnings, because um, ultimately, what do you have? You basically have a, a loan from the plan to the employer. That, that's ultimately what it, is, what it is. It's a prohibited transaction. So there's a process for figuring that num those numbers out. There's an online calculator that the Department of Labor has. Um, you, you figure it out, you pay the excise taxes, and hopefully you get that no action letter from the Department of Labor. Question five, liability for a past fiduciary breach. So upon taking his fiduciary role for the Buckeye Pension Plan, Zeke realizes that its predecessor, Eddie, breached fiduciary duties relating to investments. Can Zeke be held personally liable for Eddie's breach? So Zeke walks in the door as the new person and knows of a breach. Is he liable for the breach? I, most of you would say, no, he's, he's not liable for the predecessor's breach, and that answer would be correct. But we have the bigger issue. We have the issue of what does Zeke have to do with respect to that breach. And, in fact, Zeke has an obligation to remedy that breach. And if he doesn't do so, then he has a fiduciary breach. So uh, if, if, if you're a new employee somewhere and, and you discover that your predecessor did something wrong when it comes to fiduciary compliance, you have an obligation to clean things up. Um, and if you don't, you can be subject to that breach. Finally, you've got Kyrie. Kyrie is a plan participant, and he asks Kevin, the benefits manager, about how he should invest his 401k plan account. Um, Kevin gives Kyrie some basic information about the plan's investment lineup, educates Kyrie on the basics, basics of risk tolerance, and gives Kyrie some thoughts on he would invest his plan funds if he were in his non-Nike shoes. Is Kevin a fiduciary based on his investment discussions? Well, Remember what I talked about with the new regulations. The new regulations have an employee exemption. Assuming that uh, Kevin is not getting uh, compensation uh, for that advice, um, he, he's going to be okay. Now, you know, I, I guess this could be extended out to say, well, what happens if those investments tank? Would there be a, some kind of general uh, ERISA fiduciary claim uh, based on that advice? And my answer to that is, is likely no. So, so that's that's so that's the last of my examples. Um, but again, you know, like I said before, I, I gave you that to-do list before I got into the the, the hypothetical situations. I, I really encourage you to go through that list internally. Uh, go through that with your benefits folks. Go through it with your HR folks, uh, and really think about what you're doing when it comes to fiduciary compliance. Because you know, nobody wants to end up paying uh, big checks to our government or or going to prison. Worst case scenario. So, you know, really consider auditing things, really consider the documentation side of things, and, and really focus on your vendor contracts when it comes to the investment side of things to make sure that things are cleaned up. Um, because, like I said, you know, take a breath and, and, and don't feel like there's just a crazy amount of things that you need to do to comply with these new regulations. It really requires you to, to analyze those contracts and think about the communications that you as plan sponsor are ultimately responsible for in sending out to your plan participants. Um, so with that, I did get one question in chat, and, and that question was, is an investment policy statement a required document? Which is a very good question. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's something that I, I, I highly, highly, highly recommend um, in the sense that, you know, as, as fiduciaries with respect to investments, we, we need to put ourselves in the best position from a, a risk position. And if we have an investment policy statement that, that lays out, you know, who 
who's on that, you know, whether it's a committee or who's the fiduciary, and how we're going to analyze and select investments, investment funds, how we're going to monitor things, and how we're going to make changes. If we have that all laid out in a well documented piece of paper and in a well documented policy, and we follow that policy, then in the event that one of those investments tanks and somebody brings suit, we can point to that investment policy statement and we can point to what we did in accordance with that investment policy statement. And the fiduciary should be in a good position because, you know, from an investment perspective, you know, yeah, sure, we, we don't we, we can't predict the future. So in two years, you know, a fund that's at thirty dollars could be at ten dollars. But if we were reasonable and prudent in selecting the fund and we analyzed it and tracked it in accordance with that policy statement, uh, the risk of, of losing that kind of case and being found liable for a fiduciary breach is, is, is very low. Now, if you have the most well-drafted IPS in the world and you don't follow it, uh, that's problematic. So, so I really do encourage folks to have an investment policy statement. Um, I'm just scrolling to see if we have any more. Um, so another question was training for fiduciaries. What do I suggest? Well, you know, there's, there's, I, this is something that I do. There's a lot of attorneys out there who do it. Um, a lot of consultants that do it. You know, I'd encourage you to reach out to your, uh, ERISA attorney, to your, uh, employee benefits consultants and say, look, you know, we, we, we want to put ourselves in the best position when it comes to plan operation from a fiduciary perspective. Uh, we'd like you to come in and audit our operations, uh, tell us what we're doing right, tell us what we're doing wrong, and then after we go through that uh, that process, then do some training. And, and, and I don't think it has to be a, a huge undertaking. Um, you know, sitting in a room with the benefits department um, for an hour or two is extremely valuable because a lot of these folks, you know, they come in and they, they work these positions, but they really don't know and understand. So, you know, one strategy is is to to walk in one day and, and sit with the head of the, the welfare department, the head of the pension department, maybe the head of the 401k department, or maybe that's the same person. You know, sit down and do training at that level and then flush out how to train um, the other staff in the benefits department. So, um, you know, I've done one hour training, I've done two hour training, I've done four hour training for, for, for large groups. So, you know, it's, I, I think it's very, very valuable and from a risk perspective, something that all employers and plans um, should think about. Um, and uh, certification to demonstrate the training. Um, yeah, it, it doesn't have to be, you know, highly technical. I mean, just a matter of, you know, paper in the file, you know, this is something I do with HIPAA training as well, you know, have the PowerPoint, have the sign-in sheet, you know, have have that file um, put aside to, to show the Department of Labor or whoever asks about it to show that you've, you've done the training. So there's really no magic to the training. Uh, it's just something that uh, I think and I know a lot of others think is, is very valuable. Um, so I think that covers everything. So I just want to thank everybody for attending, um, uh, you know, like I said, Take a look at my to-do list, uh, and if you've got any questions, you know, please don't hesitate to, to reach out to me, or you know, I'd encourage you to reach out to your cons other consultants or, or attorneys on this uh, fiduciary issue because uh, you know the, the the risk is is high, and and the dollar amounts can be significant. So uh, with that, I thank you.